Um, thank you for joining us uh, for this one hour webinar on the art of the deal. What will happen if the US withdraws from the nuclear agreement with Iran? I'm Harold Tor, I'm the head of carbons at SEPS. The joint comprehensive plan of action, JCPOA, will expire soon on 12th of May. US President Donald Trump has threatened to abandon the deal, which limits new Iran's nuclear program in return for, sanct for sanction relief. French President Emmanuel Macron said yesterday that Trump should stick to the Iran nuclear deal, saying there's no better option. It, Iran, in return, has responded saying that the US would pay a high price for breaking the JCPOA and has since piled pressure onto the EU. What are the domestic and international ramifications if Trump walks away from the JCPOA? What will happen if Trump imposes nuclear-related sanctions on Iran? Before we proceed further in this webinar, I would just like to do some housekeeping. Um, the discussion will continue for about 40 minutes until 12.40, and it will be followed by 20 minutes Q&A. Before that, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A section of um, the program so that we can go directly into the session at 12.40. Joining us today are Dr. Stephen Blockmans and Dr. Majid Gopur. Dr. Blockmans is the head of EU foreign, Affair, uh, foreign <coughs> policies at SEPS. He's also professor of EU external relations law and governance at the University of Amsterdam and one of the founding members of the Center for the Law of EU External Relations. Dr. Gopur is, inter, is, in, is at the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Religion and Secularism at the Free University of Brussels, ULB. And I shall now pass the floor to Dr. Blockman, please. Thank you, Harold, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us uh, this afternoon on, on what is uh, the beginning of a a week potentially defining or redefining the US position on uh, the nuclear deal. As you know, and as Harold has, um, has alluded to, the 12th of May signifies the expiry of a statutory deadline under US law, which requires the president, president to, uh, to recertify the uh, Iran deal, uh, barring which a snapback of sanctions, nuclear related sanctions, uh, happens on, uh, on that date. And we've seen, of course, at previous intervals um, that Mr. Trump has made uh, a lot of hay of his opposition to the JCPOA, which harks back to his position as a candidate uh, for the presidency. And in that consistent line of reasoning, he is called um, the deal which was negotiated, of course, under his predecessors, um, auspices, uh, Barack Obama, that is, um, an embarrassment that is not in the US national interest and that needs to be corrected. And here, the emphasis he places is on two elements. One, the so-called sunset clauses, expiry dates after which um, Iran could resume enrichment, and these uh, dates would fall back uh, as of 2025. Uh, the U.S. is looking for uh, an extension of that date. And second, the inspection regime um, under which the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IEAA, verifies Iran's compliance with its commitments. Uh, that is also considered as being too light. Um, the U.S. government had pushed very hard for the, during the negotiations for the IEAA to uh, be granted access anytime, anywhere. 24-7 um, inspection uh, possibilities, including to military sites, but instead the JCPOA has provided detailed procedures for what is called managed access uh, of the IEA to inspect sensitive and often highly secured uh, sites. So in uh, previous occasions where Mr. Trump has also passed the buck to Congress in order to see whether they might um, uh, falter on the deal. Uh, in fact, he was thrown, uh, thrown it back into his lap. And he has uh, made no secret of the fact that he wants to terminate uh, the deal. Um, and in fact, has issued an, an ultimatum. 
on Congress and European partners uh, to the deal to fix those two elements that uh, had mentioned that uh, had been mentioned, uh, and also to counter Iranian aggression um, and supporting the Iranian people. Countering Iranian aggression is uh, related to the increased activity in the ballistic missile program by Tehran and uh, what is perceived as uh, mischievous meddling in uh, neighboring countries, primarily, of course, Syria, but also Lebanon, Iraq, and uh, Yemen. And so Trump has mentioned that if the deal is not fixed, um, that it will be nixed. The Europeans, of course, uh, have a big stake in maintaining the deal. It is one of the flagship uh, successes of EU foreign <coughs> policy at the high diplomatic table. Um, Federica Mogherini, the high representative for foreign affairs and security policy of the European Union, uh, has also uh, touted the deal as, uh, as a signature success, saying, as we Europeans were indispensable to reach the deal with Iran, we are and we will still be indispensable to preserve the deal in the difficult weeks and months in ahead in unity as we have reaffirmed time and again. And indeed, the EU's uh, standard mantra has been that it sticks to uh, the deal and it has issued a whole series of arguments in support of doing so. And it is exactly on those points that Macron today and Merkel later this week will try and pressure uh, Mr. Trump into continued compliance. I've listed at least uh, six arguments there could be more. Uh, one is, of course, that stepping away from the nuclear deal, the, e the US, in fact, would, um, would violate common principles of international law. The treaties are to be upheld. Second, um, the US would undermine the very authority of the body it is one of the permanent members of, the UN Security Council, that has endorsed the agreement by annexing it into a a legally binding UN Security Council resolution in 2015. A third argument would be that while well, this agreement has become a key element of the international non-proliferation architecture and threatening the deal might in fact undermine the US's own chances at striking an agreement with North Korea just at a time when Trump and Kim are supposed to be sitting down to, to negotiate non um, nuclear or nuclear non-proliferation on the Korean Peninsula. A fourth argument would be that the agreement itself is nuclear in focus and should not be sullied with additional um, security uh, concerns such as ballistic missile control and regional security. The EU has consistently um, argued that those can be addressed in other fora um, and in other formats. One other format uh, that one can think of is, of course, additional um, uh, arms control treaties, as we've seen them in the past as well, with uh, the START agreement leading into a START II and even negotiations on the START III, which, however, never materialized. A fifth agreement, uh, argument would be that um, correcting the deal, in fact, distracts from Iran's poor human rights records and uh, popular disconsent over economic and political uh, stagnation. And we've seen mass protests around New Year, our New Year, that is, um, into, into the streets in, in several cities around Iran. And finally, a sixth argument would be that it is highly unlikely that a stronger accord uh, could be built on the ashes of the JCPOA, which was the combination of more than a decade of very difficult, arduous uh, multilateral negotiations uh, on, conducted under the auspices of no less than three successive EU high representatives. Now, the EU itself has seen some uh, activity, uh, as alluded to by Macron's and Merkel's visits. In fact, the three biggest EU member states that were party and signatory to the JCPOA have moved in order to placate Mr. Trump ahead of the May 12th uh, deadline. Britain, uh, which is of course in Brexiting mode, has been more pliable, it seems, to American pressure by setting up um, an expert group on fixing the flaws of the JCPOA. Um, 
and this was this was set up by Boris Johnson and then Foreign Secretary uh, Rex Tillerson. France and Germany, however, take a line which is um, closer to the EU common positions which have been adopted uh, since 2015, July 2015, when the JCPOA was uh, was signed. Um, Le Drian, Macron himself, have been in contact, of course, uh, over the phone or in visits uh, to Tehran, um, in pressuring on the ballistic missile program, uh, regional security issues, and have threatened uh, with the, the potential uh, adoption of new sanctions uh, adopted by the EU on top of those that still exist and which are non-nuclear in nature. In fact, they, they lobbied other member states quite hard in uh, ahead of the Foreign Affairs Council on uh, last week on Monday, exactly a week ago, uh, to adopt such uh, sanctions, but were unable to uh, because Italy led a minority group of member states saying that it would in fact uh, be counterproductive to uh, to the deal itself and, and push Iran, the Iranian government, at least further away from uh, sticking to it. So the EU is, uh, is, is, is um, wavering, it seems, between um, efforts to placate, not to appease Mr. Trump, while at the same time keeping the nuclear deal intact. And there are good reasons, of course, for the EU to take such a strategically independent uh, position. Now, what happens um, in case the Mr. Trump withdraws the US, nevertheless, from the, uh, from the Iran deal, um, is something that uh, Majid Golpur will discuss in a number of scenarios, um, as well as the, the contingency planning which uh, economic operators, mainly European, that of course have benefited from the opening since 2015, uh, will have to take account uh, of. So Majid, over to you, and then maybe we can wrap it up um, with some final comments before opening up to a QA. and a Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you to bringing all these very important points. And as we know, uh, what is happening now and to capture all these details is such a difficult task. So uh, what to do? Uh, I take some PowerPoints with a lot of element information about the domestic situation in Iran, how the European um, can be touched and uh, what will be the impact of the sanctions, if any, in 12. Uh, but we are not going now directly on this subject. I, I just go in very, uh, I hope, focused paper for about 15 minutes. And then after we will see uh, how we can develop more uh, on debate, uh, more we can say the, uh, the real uh, tendency we will have after 12, uh, if we can uh, capture a scenario. 12th of May. Yes. Yes. So, on January 12, President Trump delivered an ultimatum to the E3 European partners, either fix the Iranian nuclear deal's disastrous flaws, or the United States will withdraw. And if so, that he would refuse to extend the U.S. sanctions relief past the May 12 deadline. During this webinar, we will try to shed some light on the outcomes and explore scenarios, possible modification, and their application, and the survival or not of the GCPA agreement. As it stands today, the United States is preconditioning its May 12 certification through the integration to the GCPA by the E3 allies of the following four critical provisions. First, quick access that Iran allow immediate inspections at all nuclear sites requested by international inspectors. Second, a guarantee that Iran never comes even close to possessing a nuclear weapon. Third, extended limitation. Unlike the current nuclear deals, 10 years sunset, closes for limits on its nuclear activity, Iran must be denied all paths to a nuclear weapon forever. And fourth, explicitly legislated program limitation that long range missile and nuclear weapons program are inseparable. And any further development and testing of missiles by Iran should be subject to severe sanctions. As we see in the fourth point, already he put some no nuclear 
important point on his name. So if Iran fails to comply with any one of these four provisions, then US sanctions would automatically resume. The weight of the ramification of the Mr. Trump's ultimatum for Europe can be measured at the international level, which I will look in four scenarios, and the Iranian domestic level, which we will look at in a final session. Okay, so let's start with the first possible scenario. The E3 meets Mr. Trump's demand. The E3, Germany, UK, and France, who are free from EU community consent and the strong from their past initiative on the GCPOA could join their US allies, but probably with a more measured and minimalist, as Stephen mentioned, yet targeted approach. On certain points, such as the newly planned sanctions against ballistic mis missile testing and Iran's non-nuclear regional expansionist, there already exists some agreement. The idea of new, no nuclear related sanctions on Iran could also rapidly make its way in the coming days in the flurry of diplomatic activities. As again, Stephen mentioned with the trip of uh, Macron and after Merkel, and could give new motivation to the Americans to stay in GCP and give the agreement a new lease of life for a short period and demonstrated that that diplomacy can work. Uh, perhaps after, because this would entail a less confrontational approach aimed at curbing the influence and activities of those responsible within the Iranian regime and with new sanctions proposed by the E3 on 15 senior Iranian official and military figures and companies. In this scenario, on May 12, the US and their E3 allies would be able to impose with the legal authority and power of the new sanctions a call to order to Iran and use this international pressure to invite them to new negotiation to give a fresh start to the agreement. The, this marriage of pressure and diplomacy could secure the EU-Iran business environment. Second scenario, scenario B, the E3 and the US do not come to an agreement. In the case of failure of the E3 group in its negotiation with the Trump cabinet, the EU's foreign affairs and security policy, represented by Federica Mogherini, who considered the deal a great success contributing to EU security, will find itself in a very uncomfortable position. Adding to existing divergence within the European community, whether it is Italy's unfailing support of the agreement or the pragmatic questions of Sweden, Spain, and Austria on the interest and usefulness of the new sanctions in relation to their business interests, this will further weaken the weight of EU diplomacy in any future negotiations. Also on the international stage, merely arguing that Iran's non-nuclear behavior be addressed separately from the GCPOA with no real actions would only strengthen the major beneficiaries of this nuclear agreement, which are China and Russia. It is worth underlining that during the popular January uprising that shook more than 100 cities across Iran, European diplomacy as a tool for peace and security was totally absent. And in the context of escalating regional tensions in Iraq, Yemen, and now Syria, the EU's diplomatic effort to invite Iran to the negotiation table have not succeeded and we could even say have failed. In this context, the basket of diplomatic solutions seem increasingly, increasingly empty and diplomats looking for immediate solution know that the time is short. It should not need to be said that the EU diplomacy needs a serious update in light of this new situation and the secondary effect provoked by the GCPOA. So, where is the Europe's plan B 
to protect its interest and respond to the new balance of power in the region. In all cases, until the EU proposes a lucid plan B, all its member states' business relations with Iran will be shrouded by darkening clouds of high risk. So the third scenario, scenario C, the, U, EU, the U.S. announced a withdrawal from the nuclear agreement. On the U.S. side, apart from decisive information at the security and military levels that could provoke changes in options and therefore scenarios at any time, from a strictly institutional point of view, things are taking shape with a good dose of rigor. As Bob Crocker, chairman of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee said, President Trump is perfectly fine walking away from the Iran nuclear deal next month. If an agreement is not reached with the EU E3 partners to address his concern. To summarize, we can conclude that the U.S. is already in a comfortable position to withdraw from the agreement, and in this case, it could be done in either of two ways. Either a soft approach as a sign of solidarity with their European allies, the U.S. could initially be satisfied with a symbolic withdrawal and for a period of time, a few months, would not activate the secondary sanctions, which would strongly affect the European's business with Iran, Thus, the sanctions reimposed in May would not be enforced, thereby providing a greater window for more negotiation on a real fix. This would have a very short time to secure already signed contracts and legalize any contracts currently in negotiation. Or the hard approach, the second approach for U.S., faced with hesitant European partners, President Trump could focus on the security card, insisting that Iran, by destabilizing regional security, have violated the spirit of the GCPOA, and he has no other choice but decertification to withdraw immediately from the agreement, bringing snapback penalties instantly into force. If this happens, European business will be seriously and directly threatened through their links with those 100 Iranian companies, institutions, and bodies identified as linked to the holding of the Supreme Guide, which will be slapped with sanctions. We can see perhaps on cover points, uh, the page from 4, 5 to 12, uh, the list of all these companies already, they are really on, um, discussion and negotiation for the new contract, especially with the European companies, uh, with the names after, please. So, yes, from here to, we can see 10 pages, the names of all the companies and all the contracts. Uh, now, uh, we are really dealing on this period of time. So, and now, scenario D, making a new GCPOA with an old P4 without the US. If a unilateral US exit happens, in which contrary to Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, both Iran and the EU are totally unprepared, we will enter a phase of ambiguity which will give rise to new regional challenges and dynamics. The positioning of the different center of power is already visible in Iran. President Rouhani, whose only achievement is the GCPOA, has asserted that until the last breath, Iran will stay in this agreement. While GCPOA chief, Mr. Arachchi, has said that he is not convinced that the GCPOA without the U.S. can survive. And the decorative and parallel minister of foreign affairs, Mr. Zarif, has just announced that Iran will surely do what is in its best interest because Iran either in or out of the GCPOA has big choices to make. All words which demonstrate the inherent contradiction of Iran's double political system add to, 
to disposition of Mr. Soleimani, the chief of extraterritorially pastoral organization who is in charge of setting up the strategic debts of the Supreme Guard in Middle East, and Mr. Velayati, the real minister of foreign affairs, who present themselves as firmly anti-GCQA, but have neatly managed to put all the financial and geopolitical profit from the agreement into strengthening their hegemonic expansion with the region. Of course, we will go have more discussion about this non-elected organization in the heart of Republic Islamic and how really they control and propose their model as uh, the unique model of, uh, we can say, exportation of uh, Iranian revolution. So the GCPA, which aim to bring about improvement in diplomatic relations across the region, has actually been an instrument to build further tension. As such, it is an illusion to think that a new P4 GCPA without US, tweaked from the original version and with the added pressure of the sanctions reimposed by the US, could offer anything positive or even relevant to the region, which is changing rapidly before our very eyes. And certainly not the security and the stability required for EU business relationship with Iran to three. And so finally, let's have a quick look at some of the domestic ramification for Iran. Iran's regional expansion, far from any effective and solid domestic governance, of the regime is done in the context of the simultaneous evolution of three major crises, legitimacy, the socioeconomic model, and the interconfessional geopolitical crisis. So together with the ultimate factor between the elected and unelected institution of the regime to designate a third supreme guide. The guide succession is the current major high risk factor for the survival of the regime, but also GCPOA. And next to today's Iran, the subject par excellence of an economic, societal, ideological upheaval, and this at the heart of a major geopolitical reconfiguration. It is in this uncomfortable and unbalanced position in which the expansionism of Iran could put into play of the survival of the regime through an internal collapse linked to the withdrawal of GCPOA, Iran could lose the sale of up to 1 million barrels of oil per day. That we can better understand the embarrassment of Iran's leader. Especially when it is the holding of the God's eco-financial empire that we can see after that monopolize and control all banks' credit, the stock exchange, major public companies, and real estate values, as well as liquidity and foreign currency market, and all import-export markets. Over the last decade, the strengthening of this holding has defeated all privatization plans, has promoted systematized corruption, and prevented access to data and the audit and regulation of account, of account control system and exchange rate control, credit and payment. Thus, Rouhani's government, which benefit from access to 120 billion US dollars of Iranian assets, top through the TCQA and the sale of more than 2.8 million barrel of oil a day, but is incapable of ensuring a growth rate to reverse unemployment and stagnation, finds itself more than 200 billion in debt to the central bank and unable to carry out a structural reform. And the corrupt banking system have insolvency for borrowing the excess 70 billion with more than a million savers who have lost their property. Actually, it's the the cause of the manifestation. So, and have lost the citizen confidence. Meanwhile, the government hope of attract, attracting more than 100 billion US dollars of foreign investment to face the challenges of massive 
unemployment and renovate the infrastructure only got four billion from 100 billion we are in four billion while during the, the same time more than 30 billion us dollar left iran this is all we can find all the information in the uh, research uh, commission of uh, parliament of iran but also in duan and import export of iran so to ensure an acceptable minimum gross rate iran needs around 90 billion and to improve only the oil infrastructure required 200 billion and adding to the ongoing series of economic policy failure is the currency crisis which has lost more than 30 percent in value against the real in less than a month so i'd like to close with a reality check president rohani is now stuck between a fragile gcpa a crumbling economy and a disproportionate regional expansion all out of reach of his control in the light of this very high level of regional and Iranian domestic risk, it would be naive for European companies to rely on the Iranian market opportunities without clearly identifying, evaluating, and mitigating their strategic risk. Otherwise, they, they, they will be the loser to China and Russia, who have already, in large part, thanks to the GCPOA for them, establish their preferred partners status in Iran without having to worry about problems such as financial transparency or the respect of any rule of law. So all eyes will now be on Mr. Trump to see which way the US goes on May 12th. Thank you for your attention. Thank so, you very much, Maki, Majid. So as I said, we can go all in all detail. Yeah. I mean, we've, uh, I think we've exhausted our time um, for our introductory remarks. So it's maybe good to, uh, to open to any questions uh, and observations that, uh, that there are from the audience uh, and take those in turn. Um, I, I have a few questions for you um, and certainly have uh, maybe some additional uh, pointers to make on how or which contingency plans uh, European states have been making, could still be making, in order to shield themselves uh, individually and or collectively from any harm done from a US withdrawal from, uh, from the JCP way under your scenarios um, B, C and D. Yes. But first, let's see if there is uh, no, no questions at the moment. But, uh, um, as, they, as, as the audience contemplates upon it. Majid, it seems that uh, your scenario C um, withdrawal with an extension of the waiver for uh, European companies to be afflicted by a snapback of extraterritorial sure. sanctions is the most realistic one uh, if one considers uh, Trump's oil tanker on this issue, which is very difficult uh, to, to change in um, exchange for only words by Macron and Merkel uh, at the moment. I mean, the Foreign Affairs Council has not come to a conclusion on sanctions mm -hmm. and any of the other fixes that, um, that Mr. Trump has asked for cannot be shown for, uh, probably not before the 12th of May. Um, there's the additional domestic US uh, consideration of the midterm elections, of course, later this year, where uh, the Republican Party may lose the majority uh, in, uh, in in the house and thereby uh, upset the possibility of um, of uh, of renegotiating the Iran deal in the sense that many Republicans, hardline Republicans, would have uh, would have wanted. Um, on on the European side, I think we we also observe some contingency planning, as I as I mentioned, France uh, in particular is. Um, once you know is offering euro denominated um export guarantees to iranian buyers of french goods uh, and services um thereby restructuring basically its financial uh, vehicles without a u.s link which would otherwise be uh, be caught by the extraterritorial effect of u.s financial sanctions 
Italy, for its part, has agreed to, um, to a framework credit agreement to fund investments in Iran um, up to 5 billion uh, euros. Germany, Austria, Belgium, they've all been contemplating plans to, um, to, to offer protection for their own companies uh, against the exposure from, uh, from U.S. sanctions. But what seems to be lacking at this stage is any serious move on the EU level mm -hmm. uh, to, to put in place a sort of blocking regulation, uh, as we've heard, as we had under the uh, Helms-Burton Act in 1996, uh, to basically curtail the uh, the effect of U.S. sanctions uh, by imposing also by imposing an obligation on uh, you on the European companies of not paying uh, to the U.S. Treasury any financial sanctions that might be imposed on them, and at the same time, if it would happen, a, reta uh, a retaliatory system whereby they could claw back U.S assets held in Europe mm -hmm. uh, to the tune of those uh, mm -hmm. sanctions. Um, we've not seen any movement yet in that uh, respect, but that, of course, could be stimulated as a result of, uh, of the 12th May decision uh, of Mr. Trump. But how likely do you think um, is it, therefore, making a bridge to the questions, um, that, uh, that Mr. Trump will be persuaded by Macron, who is said to be his closest confidant on uh, the international scene, um, by the arguments you know, that, that he and Merkel would put forward. What do you think is the likelihood of that? Yes. For go more, and also we have some uh, requests here, of course, with you, we can put, uh, we can, um, of course, uh, give the PowerPoint and we'll see after. But if we can go on the PowerPoint in the page, perhaps 20 four or five, the, the, as you know, when uh, GCPA it was signed, especially by um, uh, Obama, the idea was to change the behavior. Yes, thank you, just here. Okay, thank you. Uh, as you see, we, we gather all the institutions, elected and non-elected, uh, of the political system, um, of Republic Islamic, and they, we have some optical illusion here in Europe than the American they have not. As you know, when Obama started his negotiation, he deal directly with the Supreme Guard, who is the representative of the non-elected institution, mm -hmm. but he have all the power. So he deal directly with this institution, and after all the matter with the foreign affairs ministry or president, it was, uh, we saw the, we can't say the, the position on the newspaper. But the real point was for him, for Obama, as for Mr. Putin, or for the Chinese, to deal with Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. The lack of European diplomacy is, they didn't, we can call very <laughs> directly, understood the mechanism of the distribution of power in Iran. And they feel, if they negotiate or they speak with Mr. Zarif, they can have some impact on the reality of the ground. And this is why uh, we are really, we can say we are in a um, very dark situation of illusion of uh, diplomacy of Europe in Iran. So this is why with all the negotiation we had, all the companies now on the table for have some contract with uh, Europe, they are between the 100 first company of Republic Islamic mm -hmm. who in their directory, you have directly the representation of the Supreme Kai, who they will be the subject of the sanction. Mm -hmm. And this is why today the time is very short, as you say. Mm -hmm. If Europe cannot upgrade their position as China, as US and Russia, and to deal directly with Supreme Guy and his representative, of course, uh, we will not see, we will not have the secure environment for our business. This is why the question of elected and non-elected institution and to know with who we must deal, I think is the first key for bring some uh, security for Iran, uh, for European companies. We have here a question uh, by Lawrence uh, Kaknawi, who asks, to what extent would EU companies with no economic activities in the US be exposed to US secondary 
sanctions in all the aspects because whenever you you have some operation in dollars you are in a sphere of us and as you if you follow the information is just now about a week iran stopped to deal with dollars all the aspect of iranian import and export now is shift to europe but i don't think it's enough because for example for technology for whatever uh, we can say the importation all the goods in their bill they are already evaluated because we bring a lot from emirates from dubai the transaction is already in dollar and in the legal point of view in the term of sanction nothing will change the only thing we change the iranian consumer they will pay more why because they must pay the exchange of euro to dollars two times and it's so, not just this i mean uh, the extraterritorial effect of us sanction is, absolutely. is of course determined by us currency being used but also the the re-export if you want of us goods and services included in the deal absolutely so whenever there's an american on the board of a company basically or whenever there's an american um produced asset which in you know the technological sphere computers etc is already hard to overcome uh, you might be caught by uh, us sanctions absolutely. in that respect in that respect i can say even uh, you know the company z chinese company for their transaction now they are the subject of the sanction already before starting to may they and they are negotiating for because they, they also they, they are banned for 7 years in all activities they are negotiating at least they paid already the billions but they are negotiating if they can continue their their efforts yeah um and, and it is in this sense that of course the, the french contingency plan you know to have yeah. you ex excluded a uh, financial uh, vehicle to deal with uh, with exports uh, from iran is a, is helpful in order to to protect also those uh, iranian buyers of, of french Absolutely. goods and services yeah, and in some extent if never europe decide to go some from b this can be one of the very strong uh, we can say the solution for all of us to oblige you know when you mix the, your diplomacy with the pressure of human rights and the pressure of the very operational solutions then the iranian come on the table of negotiation for the moment for the moment whatever we have is the just negation no we, we are not discuss but if you have more pressures uh, especially because of the kora situation now this uh, this possible negotiation between uh, North Korea and US put a lot of afraid yeah. for Iranian side. So yeah. this is why uh, I think really we must uh, promote some from B for our European uh, yeah. companies because without this we would be lost. So. We have another question which plays to the domestic and the uh, international uh, drivers for Mr. Trump's decision. Is he playing to his uh, to his base, electoral base, and or um, pleasing the saudis in, uh, in putting extra pressure is a is a question which is posed uh, both and even more for his personal position because this gives him a lot of uh, we can't say the power to to exist and to justify why he is there but of course the the amount of the deal with israel and the saudi arabia and also this coalition they could make this last uh, two years is absolutely huge and if you see the plan of from the 13th of the, the France of Saudi Arabia. This will include all the sphere of Middle East. So this is why I think uh, this is a very um, uh, serious uh, uh, ultimatum. And we cannot be just uh, happy to, to have some critical article in our newspaper and to say, so nothing will happen. So yeah. many things will happen and we must make ourselves ready. So the, the, the answer to the question is, uh, an unequivocally yes uh, both uh, playing to his base uh, ahead of the upcoming uh, us midterm elections and of course um, emphasizing his uh, his his unequivocal support for israel and uh, we've seen some unilateral decisions being taken of course uh, on that front as well as saudi arabia with with which the biggest arms deal 110 billion uh has been concluded with uh, with us so in fact yes two arch enemies of iran are being uh, supported here by uh, by by trump and uh, that may well 
um, inform his uh, decision. There's another question, um, Majid, which, um, which has given that Congress generally supports the JCPOA. Um, oh no, that, that's the same question, uh, excuse me. Um, no, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've run through those that, uh, that have already been mentioned on, uh, on the slide. Do you have any questions, by the way? We have people in the room uh, as well. Um, so Majid, um, explain, explain us a little, uh, a little better how the, uh, the internal power structure of what is effectively a political, military, intelligence and commercial complex um, how that uh, how that decides how that influences decision making, and how divorced the interlocutors of the EU are uh, in this respect. And you you pointed to Zarif as the the logical counterpart, of course, for Mogherini to deal with, and uh, and uh, and Rouhani as well. And so, how how does that relate to one another? Yes, in Iran we have two armies, two model of economy two model of education, two model of style of life, and uh, also two foreign policies. And how they deal and why we are on this situation is a very long history, but to make it short, uh, the situation is today for GCPOA, because we can go perhaps next slide. Up. This one. Yes. Uh, um, yes, thank you. Uh, on this point, uh, because of the gravity of the impact of sanctions, we remember when uh, Obama pushed really Khamenei to, to sign this uh, contract, they had a choice, economically speaking. So what's happened on that time, the idea was to deal with Iran will allow the change of behavior of all these organisms, non-elected institution who they are really hidden themselves in the back of uh, Zarif and uh, the president and so but on that time we couldn't imagine all these institutions they will take profit of the deal you know it is a huge amount 120 billion of dollars it was liberate for them none of iranians see the benefit of the gcpa why because all this money was channelized via of all these organisms via of all these institutions to regional expansions so they were absolutely sure because of the cause of their ideology they are in right path and they had perhaps I don't know. Perhaps it was a nice opportunity for expansion. But, but this expansion, sorry, this expansion was in detriment of Iranian economical growth. And this is why we are standing now today. Exactly. So, uh, in fact, in depth with uh, the own banking system, uh, with, uh, with corruption levels uh, going through the roof, uh, with currency uh, crisis. And with competition um, with the neighbors, with, with more money leaving the country than uh, foreign direct investment Absolutely. being uh, being attracted. So, w what is the what is the room for maneuver really for for this particular government uh, in Iran, given the ultimatum that uh, Trump has given to Congress and the European allies? Can the Iranian government uh, truly uh, and justifiably? argue that you know it will push back uh, any u.s uh, withdrawal and uh, and snap back of sanctions can yes credibly yes. do that yes we have because we are not again two choices because we have two organisms two economy we have two choices one of the choices is to see iran expansion on middle east they will go more fast than saudi arabia the program plan of saudi arabia is in two, two 2013, but Iran can already have his zone of influence in Iraq, in Syria, very close to Israel. They make a very highway from Tehran to Jerusalem. Everything is ready. So on the military aspect, I think they are not so short and they are not late. And this is why today, they, they, we can say the, the request to include this non-nuclear sanction on the nuclear sanction why because in the first of the gcpa we really desire to change the behavior but now so many people speak about the change of regime 
the GCPA changing their behavior now go, go to GCPA to changing regime. So this is why this duality of policy, of course, Mr. Rohan is in very, very bad position. He's, he he bring a very critical uh, talk just two days ago against Guardian of Revolution, defending the army of Iran, say they are never in corrupt, they are never, you know, it's a very funny situation. And this is why all these very uh, nuanced and very gris uh, sphere of policy of Iran is hidden by European, uh, and thanks to SEPSA, <laughs> us to go more deep on this situation. It's really, we have in one part, the possibility to have a real war in Middle East between Iran, Israel, and Saudi Arabia right now. And this is why to just say GCPA, GCPA, and this is like a mantra for European diplomacy. It, it is a little bit funny because as we are disconnected with the reality of the ground. Yeah, but to be fair for the European diplomats, they are pushing, of course, on regional security and they are pushing oh. on the ballistic missile oh. You must bring by, the, by, you must bring... by threatening with the imposition of new sanctions. Yes, and this is why, for me, personally, I really uh, wish uh, we will have something around E3 and US because they are much more mature about the situation. And don't forget, uh, Germany, France, and UK, they are the, the forces who start all these negotiations. They are in behind of all this uh, real diplomacy of power of democracy. Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, um, Union, uh, European Union paid the price of uh, immaturity, I don't know if you allow me. And uh, if something happened uh, adapted to the situation, I think we'd be on the side of E3 US. Yeah. We have another question from uh, Mr. Sugimoto, um, who asked, raising the oil price, a rise in the oil price due to this situation, would, would that be um, positive uh, for Mr. Trump uh, or, or not? He's a businessman. In all the situation, he will make the situation in such a, uh, we can say, it, uh, deal. Who he will not pay is always others they must pay, and he. And this is the diplomacy of Trump. And this is what, this is why we are always in some imprevisible situation. He may, like now, everybody wait for 12 May, and he's a businessman. He put he bring the business on diplomacy. And it's, it's true, uh, one day he said, we must go back from Syria. Another day, all his staff said it is not possible because of... So would rising oil pr prices play to his play into his cards or would it be... Internally, yes, because this brings some justification for all the exploration of American petrol and all the expense they have for the infrastructure. But in the Middle East, it is some deal between Russia and Saudi Arabia about this point. And we will see how... It is not the first purity of all, you know, when, when you prepare yourself for a real war, uh, fixing the price of petrol, it is not in your top purity. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay, let me see if there's any other questions not from, uh, from the audience. Um, th th there's been a, an argument made that uh, Iran will have to give something in return as well if it wants to keep on benefiting from the sanctions relief uh, which the JCPOA has uh, provided it and with the positive uh, agenda which uh, the European Union has hammered out under the joint communique with Zarif published uh, mm -hmm. April 2016 so as to develop bilateral socio-economic uh, relations even more deeply. So what is it, do you think, that Iran would be willing to, the Iranian government at this stage, would be willing to, to give or to sacrifice in order to help the European Union um, keep Trump to the deal? First, I think, um, is uh, to bring the agreement they accept between themselves, between Mr. Velayati and Mr. Zari, who is the foreign ministry for Iran. And on this case, if we be on the position to officialize the Iranian institutional positioning for Europe, we can expect perhaps to negotiate about Iranian position, military position in Iran, with the request of Mr. Macron, and also Iranian um, situation in Syria. 
This is why Europe can really go negotiate officially about the Iranian presence with giving some, we can say, the credit on the uh, real economic plan who we have not for the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think this can start. First, we can ask about 120 billion uh, in their hands if they can bring any proof for the improvement of economical situation in Iran. And on this, I think Rouhani is very, very, very ready because we will give him some possibility to turn back all these non-elected institutions in the back, and he will have the position really for the first time to talk about the strategical, um, we can say, area of economy, of uh, policy, and also collaboration with Europe. Well, the difficulty I see with, uh, with Syria and Iraq is that Iran is not in a position to provide much. Yes, it has a role to play, but it is also, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's only a cog in a big uh, machinery, of course, with Turkey, Russia uh, also playing big roles in the Syria Astana process. So there it has little, in fact, that it can sway uh, the Europeans and Mr. Trump. On Iraq, similarly, the argument is being made for Yemen. Uh, where there is, of course, uh, an Iranian support for the Houthis, uh, but which is less ideological, it seems, other than to be of an annoyance to the Saudi intervention um, in, uh, in Yemen, where there might be more willingness on uh, the Iranian government side to, to be accommodating on that regional security aspect in order to show goodwill um, and placate some of the concerns which, um, which Europeans have uh, on the famine in Yemen, uh, which I would like to see stopped, on this senseless war that uh, Saudi's, uh, Saudi Arabia is waging on uh, its neighbor, and uh, on keeping the, the Bab al-Mandeb uh, Strait uh, open for international shipping, which is of course of interest ultimately to, uh, to the economy of, uh, of Europe as well. So, there it seems that the Iranian government would have less to lose in a way than on Syria where it has a heavy, heavily invested in its presence of course and where it has bigger ambitions as you've alluded to and, uh, and Iraq. So on regional security we might see some, uh, some movement so there I agree with you um, where exactly we'll have to, we'll have to see. But uh, just a very quick point. Uh, now Rouhani is really very clever, very ready and he know Hezbollah will be the, 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 the first target after 12 May. And so he, I think between Baton and Caro, he is always uh, more Caro, and uh, he knows the situation will, uh, will arrive. And to open a very uh, transparent negotiation about the military presence of Iran on the region uh, coming from Europe, I think he will uh, welcome this discussion because they already. Uh, uh, they, their demand to American Zarif actually asked yesterday. Yeah. Uh, we must open the discussion, and we must. Uh, but I think they are much more uh, ready for for Europe. But from Europe, we have not the we can't say the, any proposal, and this is the the problem of our our instant present. Mr. Fieri is not common. We just uh, put the insistence of the, in GCPOA. And we think the things will uh, resolve by themselves, but this is not true. No, yes, I know. I mean, it's true that the European Union has very little instruments at its disposal in order to de block this situation. By the same token, Mogherini herself is in, in several uh, international uh, contexts talked to Zarif about Yemen, for example. Without um, no proposal, without no solution. Yeah. And the solution to really propose to Zarif and uh, Rouhani, please clarify between yourself who represents you on the Middle East, mm. because even for Moderni now is problematic. Yeah. And this is why I think Europe must really make themselves uh, now ready to go negotiate with non-elected institutions in Iran, as all others, Russia, China, and... Uh, so in, uh, in conclusion, you, um, I think our, our predictions are rather, are rather somber in this uh, respect. Final question, very quick from Eric van der Kooi, who asks, uh, the deal was domestically sold as wholesale sanction relief, domestically meaning Iran. Uh, what's the position of the Iranian leaders to their citizens now because of a possibly turn by Trump? 
mean? Uh, well, what is the position? How do you do, does the Iranian government now explain to its citizens uh, the maintenance of you know the, the yes. benefits which the JCPOA has, uh, has supposed mm -hmm. benefits which the JCPOA has brought? Given Trump's like uh, always, possession, uh, like always, complot uh, is the therapeutic uh, speech. Uh, people uh, really with the new uh, anti-American battle, people really go beyond of all the situation and any any concrete situation. And the problem is today the expectation raised by GCP in Iran it was so huge, and all Iranians uh, really wait for some answers. And this is why we can understand better. The reason of all this manifestation and the soci social protestation in Iran. Yeah. 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 Okay, on that somber note, I think we need to conclude. Um, 12th of May is coming very soon. I think uh, not all chips are on the table in order to be confident enough to say that uh, Mr. Trump will recertify uh, the deal or will have some kind of truncated withdrawal with an extension of the sanctions waiver um, we're not certain yet and mr trump has of course proven to be uh, whimsical enough to change his position but uh, we'll have to see whether macron and Merkel are able to convince him this week my hunch would be that they cannot prov uh, provide uh, the proof that mr trump has yeah. asked for in his ultimatum Absolutely. that the deal be fixed uh, in or outside uh, in whatever form so on those uh, somber uh, concluding words, Harold, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Blockmans, uh, Dr. Gopur. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this webinar. Should you have any feedback, please email it to us at comms at seps.eu. You can also reach us on Twitter at seps underscore think tank. For future similar events, please subscribe to our newsletters on the website. We will also make any documents pertaining to this webinar available on the event page itself and inform all participants by email. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon.